This is an audio renaissance presentation of Murder with a Twist. Six unabridged mysteries from Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Narrated by Morgan Fairchild and Roddy McDowell. Produced by Joe McNeely. Celia Fremlin. Narrated by Roddy McDowell. Through the tiny moment of suspense, the passing flicker of dread, lest, this time, Carl would not be waiting for him at their usual table. This was all part of William's Tuesday happiness. Oh, and he wouldn't have missed it for anything. He paused in the doorway of the discotheque, savoring these moments of delicious terror delicious because unfounded, while the pop music that Coral loves streamed out past him into the winter night, and his eyes searched the rosy dimness inside for a gleam of cool blonde hair, for a glimpse of pouting, impatient lips, fashionably metallic and drawing restless with waiting on yet another cigarette. As he stood there, bathed in the drumbeat rhythm, and with the pale, glittering young people surging past him out of the night, William didn't feel forty-eight. He didn't feel married, and least of all did he feel like the saintly, devoted paragon of a husband that his wife's illness had forced him into becoming. Yes, forced. All through the years when Eleanor had been well and strong and like anyone else's wife, William had been like anyone else's husband, cheerfully selfish, casually loving, and full of complaints, as are a man's rights. But Eleanor's illness had finished all that. It had silenced his complaints, poleaxed his selfishness. All that was left was the loving, casual no longer, but nursed and coddled like an overfed cat, bloated with pity and good intentions. What a wonderful husband, the neighbors were beginning to say of him. Whatever would she do without him? The patience of an angel. Never a cross word. Even now that she's grown so trying, poor thing. Actually, he had been hustled into being wonderful inch by inch and fighting all the way. Slowly, inexorably, Eleanor's aching back, her worsening stomach pains, had forced him back and back, blocking first one exit and then another, until, at last, here he was, like a man trapped by the advancing tide, finally and irrevocably at the mercy of her encroaching illness. By attacks of nausea, by bouts of uncontrollable shivering, her sickness had got him into its power bit by bit. Day after day, it had molded him, twisting and transforming his commonplace flesh into an angel substance, the stuff of which martyrs are made. He had accepted his role of martyr because he could not fight it. He nursed Eleanor with tenderness and devotion because these seemed to be the only tools left to him, and his reward for all this was a monstrous, ever-increasing tedium as Eleanor grew more and more boring, lapsed more and more into pain. Someone had put on another record. It roared out from the russet darkness of the discotheque like a trumpet call to youth, and William's nostrils quivered at the summons like those of an old war horse. Youth! Youth! His forty-eight years seemed to slide away into the night, and so did all thought of his dreary middle-aged wife hollowed out by her dreary, middle-aged operations. He was free, free of it all for one golden evening, free like those bearded striplings, like these dozy, half-grown girls, delicious in their ignorance of pain, free, free. His magic Tuesday evening had begun. 
William pushed open the swinging door and marched, head held high, into the very shrine of youth. Marched tall and proud because he had a girl in there of his very own. A girl as gloriously young as the rest and as delectable and waiting for him. Oh, Willie, there you are. I was beginning to think something had happened. I was afraid you had to stay with her. Oh, Willie, darling. She always welcomed him with these exclamations, reaching out her silver-tipped little fingers to draw him down beside her into the place that she had been guarding for him on the red plastic cushions. He loved the feel of her soft hands, not yet touched by work, and he loved, too, her never-failing surprise. Tuesday after Tuesday at his successful arrival at the rendezvous. The predictability of her every word and gesture was infinitely soothing to him. It gave to these Tuesday evenings a luminous quality. The precious minutes sliding through his fingers like a necklace of well-loved jewels. He knew already what her next words were going to be and how he was going to answer them, he waited, joyously expectant as a child awaiting his familiar bedtime story. Is she any better? Carl's voice held just the note of anxious melancholy that is appropriate for asking about a hopeless invalid. But behind the sweet concern in her grey eyes, William could see dancing an eagerness for morbid details that exactly matched his own aching need to confide them. Coral loved to hear of Eleanor's petulance, her sick-room fads and fancies, her endless aches and pains, loved to hear of them every bit as much as William longed to tell of them. It made them both feel so healthy, he and Coral, so vital, so united in the singular glory of not being ill. And so William shook his head sadly, as he always did, in answer to Carl's inquiry. He looked into her sparkling, expectant eyes, and to keep that enchanting eagerness dancing for him, he raked his weary memories for the things she loved most to hear. She loved to hear that Eleanor had refused to take her medicine again, that she scolded William for not responding quickly enough to her night bell, endlessly dragging him from sleep. She loved to hear that Eleanor had asked him, perhaps, for dry toast yeah, or a glass of orange juice, and then, when he brought it all to her, all daintily set out on a pretty lace cloth, had turned her face away in disgust, refusing to eat. Oh, dear, Carl would say, licking her little silver lips. Oh, dear, I am sorry. But the pain's better, is it? Uh, the pain in her back? Carl loved to hear about the pain in Eleanor's back. It made her own spine feel so straight and strong and youthful. She gave a lissom little shrug with it now, while she breathed her condolences, and William watched the small movement with delight. He leaned forward and kissed the smooth, unlined cheek under the fall of gleaming hair. Oh, how marvellous it is to touch a woman who is well. Coral glowed and flaunted her wellness before him for just the right length of time before gently prompting him, for after all, their time was short. She's not worse, though, is she? She suggested, laying her little hand on William's with sweet concern. The doctor doesn't think she's worse. The sweet secret zest in the young voice was to William like the forked flame of desire itself, and he responded to it like a lizard to the sun, his mind coming alive, darting this way and that among the sordid sick-room trivia for the kind of nourishment on which his and Coral's relationship flourished and grew fat. Mm, no, not worse. Not really, he said with studied fairness and wetting Carl's appetite by the tiny delay. But it's a sickness, you see. She, she can't seem to keep anything down, no matter how carefully I prepare it. Carl's silvery, knowledgeable voice broke in right on cue. You know why that is, Willie, don't you? You do realize...
equating food with love. By rejecting the food you offer her, she's rejecting your love, rejecting it out of jealousy, because she can't bear not to have all of it. In every minute of the day, her demands on your love have gone beyond all reason, my poor darling. Sweet Coral. She never failed him. Never. Oh, Coral, how wonderful it is to be with someone who understands. I couldn't talk about this to anyone else in the whole wide world because it seems such a dreadful thing to say about one's own wife. But I have wondered myself sometimes if it isn't psychosomatic, I mean, some of it. How the silver earrings bobbed and danced in a sort of ecstasy of understanding. Yes. Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, poor Eleanor. I'm sure she doesn't realize it herself, but after all, see, an illness is a way of keeping a husband at home, isn't it? When a woman hasn't, well, hasn't much else to hold him with to make him want to stay with her. She sipped her coffee delicately, watching him over the rim of the cup with gray, thoughtful eyes. The most wonderful part of the whole evening was just beginning the moment they got to Eleanor's unconscious motivations. Like gods, they soared together over the sick woman's disintegrating personality, pouncing on a complex here, a neurosis there, handing them back and forth to each other like jewels, with little cries of admiration. Of course, looking back, I can see she always had these incipient hypochondriac tendencies. Well, she can't help it, of course. It's, it's no use blaming her. Lying in bed all day. <laughs> it's no wonder her back hurts. Well, and, and it's not as if the doctor wasn't giving her plenty of painkillers. You know, I've sometimes wondered if that pain of hers is really as bad as she fancies it. I once read an article which said that jealousy, though especially sexual jealousy, yeah, and all that throwing up in the night, unconscious demand for attention because she can't bear her husband to escape from her, even into sleep. The coffee in the two cups cooled in front of them as they talked. They needed no stimulant, for the thought of Eleanor, ugly and repellent on her bed of sickness, filled them with such a sense of their own health that it was like wine. It was like immortality itself. But all too soon it was over. At eleven o'clock, William must be home again, his weekly respite at an end. And only then do they look away from each other, a sort of shyness rising between them. If only, began William, and stopped. And at the same time, Coral murmured, How long? And checked herself. They moved out of the discotheque in silence for they could not trust themselves to say another word. When William got home, he found that Eleanor had been sick again. As happened more and more frequently now, she had failed to get her head properly over the enamel bowl at her bedside. And as William, a teeth clenched in a ghastly smile, set himself to his disgusting task, it suddenly flashed through his mind this would be the last time. I don't have to go on like this. And that night, as he tipped the allotted two sleeping pills into his wife's bony, outstretched palm, the bottle shook and shuddered in his hand, and he felt the sweat springing out on his forehead so that he had to turn his face away. The impulse subsided almost as suddenly as it had assailed him. But it had left its mark. And, during the ensuing week, it would not leave him alone. Oh, it would be so easy. Several times, as the days went by, he looked at the bottle as it stood on a bathroom shelf and had fantasies of mashing the pills and stirring the powder, all of it, into his wife's nighttime cup of gruel. He had visions of rushing into the discotheque next Tuesday, crying, Oh, she's dead! She's dead! And flinging himself into Coral's arms, and both of them sobbing with joy. Uh, but he knew, really, 
that it was only a vision. One night he tipped a whole lot of the pills into the palm of his hand, handled them, and knew for certain oh, that he would not dare. By the very feel of them on his bare skin set his heart pounding and dizziness so blurred his vision that he could scarcely get the pills back into the bottle. Two, three, no, several of them went pitter-patter across the floor, and as he bent to retrieve them, he felt the breath choking in his lungs, and his heart thudded as if it would burst through his ribs. No, he, William, was not the sort of which murderers are made. He was the sort who would suffer, who would let Coral suffer. The weeks, the months, the years would go by, their love would wither, and still Eleanor would live on. William? William? The weak yet urgent voice twanged against his nerves, and he gave a guilty start. William, where are my pills? The voice demanded, peevish and despairing. Why are you being so long? Hastily, hands still trembling, he stuffed the last few pills back in the bottle. Coming, dear, uh, coming. And he hurried into his wife's room. He looked into the grey, sunken face, in which no spark of beauty or gaiety was left. He looked at the stick-like arms that once, in their bloom, had held him close. Oh, if only I had the courage! But... He had reckoned without Eleanor's courage. The next morning, the Tuesday morning, the bottle of pills was empty and Eleanor was dead. Dead on a Tuesday. Dead on his glorious day. Had she known? And had she, knowing, chosen this day on which to release him? He did not call the doctor or, indeed, call anyone. Coral! 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 When I see Coral... And he sat all day in the silent house, waiting for the relief and the joy to wash over him, waiting for the moment when he could rush through the crowded discotheque, crying just as he had in his dreams, She's dead! She's dead! The discotheque was more crowded and noisier than ever. And at first, uh, Coral did not hear what he was saying. She's what? She asked, and he leaned forward to repeat the news. She's... She... He stopped. And he knew in that instant he could never tell her. For where now would be that sense of united well-being, that glorious sense of their joint health in contrast to Eleanor's sickness? What would they talk about, he and Coral, now that Eleanor's symptoms, her complaints, and her unreasonableness were gone? Where would be Coral's marvelous sympathy and understanding now that Eleanor had escaped them forever? had moved on into a realm where the barbed insights of pop psychology could not follow her. What was Coral, anyway, now that she was no longer a bulwark against his dying wife? William stared across the table at the empty-faced little blonde who was waiting so impatiently for him to speak. She is... Uh, uh, she's worse... Oh, my poor Willie. She kept you up again last night, didn't she? Oh, I can see she did, you poor darling. You look so tired. But you shouldn't give in to it, Willie. You really shouldn't. After all, we know, don't we? She's not really in pain. It's only her unconscious aggression and jealousy. It was all right. It was the old Carl again, just as she had always been. Oh, nothing had been changed. Nothing spoiled. Their Tuesday conversations could go on exactly as before. But for how long? For how long can you keep your dead wife propped up against the pillows, never calling a doctor, never letting the neighbors in? He, William, 
too much of a coward to be a murderer, was going to be transformed as the days went by into a creature far, far worse than a murderer. A monster. A ghoul. The horror of it would blaze across the front page of every Sunday paper. And all because he didn't dare do anything. He wondered, dreamily, were there any others of the ghouls and monsters of the world had attained their awful status in this way? By just doing nothing.